So I want to break down why I believe MBS Mohammed bin Salman may have a big role in making the temperature in the Middle East go lower, specifically with Iran, Israel, because if you are him and you're very ambitious, you're one of the top 10 most powerful men, according to Forbes, and you're one of the most charming, best personalities, you're worth 25 billion, you are the prime minister, you're about to be the king, you got all this personality, charm, salesman, Machiavellian, he probably read the book Prince or 40 Laws of Power, he seems like that kind of a guy, but you are living in the Middle least and you want to get people from all over the world to come to you for tourism and yes you can say well Saudi's a very safe place and we have this and look at Ronaldo's here Formula One and all these other things that we're doing but a lot of people still look at your neighbors and say your surrounding area isn't that safe and a lot of people say they're not going to come over to you so it's on you to do something drastically that is unconventional for the world to say I feel safe coming to you so tough job but we got a lot of things we investigated about this guy very very interesting how he views religion in a way that's controversial to many even in Saudi we're going to talk about MBS today okay so if you get value out of this video give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel let's get right into it so here's what we're going to cover we're going to learn about him then we're going to learn about the vision then we're going to learn about the role Saudi plays in the Middle East as well as world peace and then you'll be able to make a decision on what you think is going to happen with this guy. So let's get right into it. MBS, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia from June 2017 till today. He's the Prime Minister of Saudi, September 22nd till today. And he used to be the Minister of Defense from January 15th to September of 2022. A couple of the things that he did with foreign policy, after he was appointed Minister of Defense in 2015, he launches a military campaign against Yemen, blockade on Qatar, and efforts to counter Iran's influence in the region. So he's not afraid pushing his weight around and saying, hey, I'm not just somebody that's a young kid coming up. I am my own man. I have my own opinions. I have my own philosophies. I want to lead, building a reputation for himself during that time. Domestic policy in 2016, he drastically cut the powers this is very interesting because as a person who lived in iran you have to know there's a lot of power when countries come up with this and he cut their power listen up he cut the powers of the c p v p v which stands for committee for the promotion of virtue and prevention of vice or better known as islamic religious police the feared CPVP, which had thousands of officers on the streets and powers to arrest, detain, and interrogate those suspected of violating Sharia, and it was banned from pursuing, questioning, asking for identification, arresting, and detaining anyone suspected of a crime. This is very norm when you're living in places in the Middle East. I experienced this personally when you're living in Iran, and I'm walking out with my mother. So for him to choose to do this, this is one of the way the government puts fear into the people. It's like, nah, we're not doing this anymore. Controversial. Cinema industry, changes it up, was reinstated. Social liberties were expanded. Gender mixing and dating have been normalized by the state in public sphere. 2017 corruption perch, another one of those things that pissed a lot of powerful people up. In November of 2017, nearly 400 of Saudi's most powerful people, among them princes, tycoons, and ministers were rounded up and detained in the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in what became the biggest and most contentious purge in the modern kingdom's history. This was after the formation of an anti-corruption committee led by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Imagine like you're coming up, you want to win the country over. The way he does it by bringing in the top 400 most powerful people and saying, hey, you can't be doing all this corruption anymore. And imagine what they're looking at. Who are you to talk to us like this? Who am I? <laughs> Let me tell you who I'm going to be here and what I'm going to do with Saudi Arabia. Everybody realize maybe this is just not another kid. He's got a real big vision. So look, I've been in the financial industry since 9-11, the day before 9-11. And I've owned stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, crypto, gold, you name it, I've owned it. But the one thing that's very important part of my portfolio all these years is gold. I love having a percentage of my net worth in gold that I have access to in case of many different things. A few facts you need to know about gold. Number one. The gold market cap is $11.8 trillion. Since 2000, the compound annual growth rate for gold has been 9.24%. And during times of high inflation, 3% plus has been 15.35%. Now, those are just some numbers for you, but there's some other benefits to add gold to your portfolio. Number one, hedge against inflation. Number two, results showed recently that 93% of central banks are working on a CBDC. So this means what? That could be a manipulated currency that they own. If you own gold, it's a non-duplicatable asset. You're now hedging against CBDC taking place. Number three, a potential cyber threat. If it happens, you don't have access to your money. You don't have access to your accounts. 
where you have access to your hard physical gold. Number four is anonymous. No one knows you have that gold. And last but not least, diversification. That's why we chose to work with our new sponsor, American Hartford Gold. If you have retirement funds that you cannot afford to lose, American Hartford Gold will ship physical gold or silver directly to your door. Also, if you have retirement funds that you can't afford to lose, now is the time to call American Hartford Gold, a precious metal dealer you can trust. They have the finest products, amazing customer service, and a buyback commitment. They've earned a five-star rating from thousands of reviews and an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau. Tell them I sent you and they'll send you up to $5,000 worth of free silver on your first order. So click on the link in the description or call 866-939-6984. Again, 866-939-6984. So again, anytime you have somebody that's very ambitious, you're going to create a lot of enemies. And journalists are going to come out and criticize you. You're going to be like, well, he's doing this, he's doing that. And as a person that's getting a lot of attention in different places, you handle it in a different way. In this case, in 2018, MBS global reputation suffered after the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in 2018. The CIA eventually concluded that he had ordered the assassination, a claim Saudi Arabia denies. This is something that the Middle East has to deal with because in the Middle East, this is what people fear. If you want athletes, if you want celebrities, if you want stars, if you want all these people to go to Saudi, I'm going to go to the Formula One race, I'm going to go watch a wrestling, I'm going to go watch this. They have to feel the safety to know that these types these types of things won't happen. This was a bit of a flaw in his reputation and his ambitions. Early on in his political career, MBS began his political career as a special advisor to his father, who was then the governor of Riyadh. His early roles in the Saudi government included positions in expert commissions of Saudi council of ministers and Saudi cabinet. His father's ascendancy and key appointments, his rise to prominence accelerated when his father became the king of Saudi Arabia in 2015. Shortly thereafter, MBS was appointed minister of defense, making him one of the world's youngest defense ministers at the time. This position placed him in charge of the Saudi military and its ongoing involvement in Yemen. So now here's a vision 2030 that he cast. Okay, in 2016, MBS unveiled Vision 2030, a strategic framework to reduce Saudi Arabia's dependence on oil, 87% of the GDP, diversify its economy, and develop public service sectors. Davos in the desert to track FDI. This includes ambitious projects such as NEOM, a $500 billion planned mega city that aims to be a hub for innovation, technology, and sustainable living, investment in sports leagues, investment in entertainment. So so think about it when you invest into entertainment are entertainers mostly conservative or liberal they're mostly liberal which means if you want entertainment to come to saudi you have to be a little bit more liberal than any other middle eastern country which is kind of a isn't that a country how are you gonna do it that's not easy so he decides to give ronaldo 200 million dollars think about your ronaldo's beautiful wife you guys got kids christiana comes home and says hey babe what's that I got a contract. Awesome. Where are we going? Barcelona? No. Manchester? No. Where are we going? Uh, Saudi Arabia. What are you talking about, babe? Yes. We're going to take our kids to Saudi. We're going to feel safe there. I don't feel safe, babe. How about for $210 million? Let's take the kids to Saudi Arabia, right? That's what happens. So he's willing to give the money, but the same money didn't work for everybody. Messi became a Saudi ambassador promoting tourism in the country. His contract reviewed by the New York Times shows that he could earn up to $25 million for his promotion over three years. His deal also angered Paris Saint-Germain uh, Qatari owners and was contributing factor to as why he was ousted from PSG. Aston Martin announced long-term strategic partnership with Aramco, which includes joint title sponsorship of the British manufacturer's F1 team. Live Golf announces an eight-tournament schedule for its new tour, which will include four-man teams competing for 54 holes with shotgun starts. The seven regular season events will have $25 million purse. The team's championship will have $50 million in prices. It gets a little crazier with golf. Live Golf announces it is expanding its team series to 14 tournaments. In 2023, would you read $405 million in purses? I think that's going to draw a lot of golfers who want to go golf there. Bloomberg reports Saudi Arabia's public investment fund explored making a $20 billion bid. You know, for what? For the entire Formula One. Not like one race for the entire Formula One. In January 2022, Liberty Media completed its acquisition of the series for $4.4 billion in 2017. Now, Andy Murray says he reiterates that he will not play in Saudi Arabia. I wouldn't play. No, I would imagine it will only be a matter of time before we see tennis tournaments played there. A couple other people, Roger Federer turns down an invitation later saying he didn't want to play there at the time. This is right after what happened with Khashoggi. And at the same time, John Cena from WWE is removed from his scheduled match. They 
days before he is scheduled to appear at Crown Jewel as the WWE faces mounting calls to cancel the event following the death of Khashoggi. And this small uh, golfer, you may know his name, you may not. His name is Tiger Woods. He turned down $800 million to stay with PGA. Why did he say no to live for $800 million? Having said that, again, anybody that has major aspirations, that personality is going to be very complicated, especially someone that has the kind of power. When you look at oil reserves, there's only one country that has more reserves than these guys. If you look at this list from Statista, it's Venezuela. 18% of the world's reserves is with Venezuela. 17% is with Saudi Arabia. Then you have Canada, Iran, Iraq, Russia, Kuwait, UAE. But Saudi, you, you are the person up there. You were 25 billion at the lowest, and it's just going to get more. And you're given all this power and influence, and you got aspirations, you got a vision, you're going to be a target. You have to be a complicated person to want to do something like this. But when somebody comes out and says the following, I want to read this to you. Saudi Crown Prince Lambast, his kingdom's Wahhabi establishment. Let me read this to you. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has delivered his sharpest attack yet on the kingdom's Wahhabi religious establishment, declaring its ultra-conservative interpretation of Islam out of date. Out of date? Who are you to say this? When he said this, he was 36 years old. Imagine the people that are there. A 36 year saying we're out of date and often based on a faulty interpretation of Islamic scripture speaking on national television in the midst of the holy month of Ramadan he also defended his promotion of secular Western entertainment in the kingdom when I had the crown prince of Iran Reza Pahlavi on last week his father in Iran the king which he's about to be he was a young king at 21 years old similar to him he was a very wealthy man very at one point cbs called mohammad reza shah Pahlavi the most powerful man on earth he was kind of going like this trying to make iran similar to western because he wanted frank sinatra elizabeth taylor sports concerts he wanted that to be taking place it's given me the vibes of wanting to do that which by the way when he did this a lot of the local people from the religious sect called Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi a puppet of the West. So he's going to get criticized for that as well. Let me continue. I'll give you more feedback here. Again, the whole part about the Western entertainment in the kingdom, which he had long condemned as heretical by its once powerful Wahhabi clerics. And now he's saying promoting of secular Western entertainment, which by the way, so where, where does the inspiration for this come? Why are you all of a sudden flipping your position from who you were to now promoting secular Western entertainment in the king? What are you talking about? That's what the old school folks are thinking about, but here's where his ideology comes from. His ideology has been described as a nationalist and a populist with a conservative attitude towards politics and a liberal stance on economic and social issues. It has been heavily influenced by the views of his former advisor, Saud al Khatani, and the ruler of Abu Dhabi, Mohammed ben Zayed. So he has his own people he's looking at as visions, but it tells me he's kind of going through the playbook of wanting to do what the Mohammed Reza Shah Pahlavi did in Iran. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Here's the reality of it. If he is trying to do this, the number one thing he needs to have with his brand is a word that starts with the letter S. Because if you don't have that, people are not going to come to you in the droves of tourism that he wants. And what's the S word? What do you think? Safety and security. We, as tourists, have to feel safe going there. If I told you right now, what criticism do you get of going to Dubrovnik, Croatia. You don't think about threats or something happened to you. Hey, let's go to vacation. We're going to go to Barcelona, Spain. You're not really too worried about it. But if you say we're going to go to Saudi Arabia, well, maybe. Why? Because it's in the Middle East. But Saudi's not that uh, problematic. It's, it's safe. Yeah, but you could be living in a safe house. But if your neighbors are problematic, that region is not that safe. So he almost has to bring the word safety to the entire Middle East because that's what the Shah did in Iran. When, when the Shah was in Iran for 37 years, the Middle East was safe. They had good relationships with Israel. They had good relationships with U.S., decent relationships with Russia, decent relationship with others, decent, decent relationship, and there wasn't chaos there. So to lower the temperature in the Middle East, I think one of the most important pieces of that happening is this man, MBS. He may be one of the top three dominoes of making that happen, and he may even be the first domino. And when you look at his allies and enemies, the top four of his enemies, you'll hear Iran, you'll hear Turkey, you'll hear Qatar, 
you'll hear some of those names as an enemy to him. Iran staying the way it is and it's kind of reckless and it's unconventional and it's funding Hezbollah and it's causing mayhem with Israel and all this stuff that's happening. Does he want Iran to be like that? Probably not. So maybe he wants to see a revolution taking place there. And maybe he wants to see democracy being there. Not sure what sect he wants it to be. Does he want it to be religious like the way it was with Khamenei or Khomeini? I don't know. He doesn't give me those vibes, but very, very interesting character. There's a reason why so many people are curious about this man. So in order to do that, you have to have leverage over other people. So what is Saudi's leverage over other countries in the Middle East and worldwide? Well, one leverage that they have is you got a lot of oil, period. They have enough oil reserve. There's data showing when is all the oil in the world going to run out. And I think if you go on the website today, it's 44 years, 38 or seven days and some few hours left where oil reserves going to run out. Except for Saudi. You know how long Saudi's oil is going to last? You ready? 221 years. They're going to be okay, right, with the amount of leverage that they got. So the way to fight off to not need Saudi is to go nuclear, but a lot of people don't want to go nuclear, and it's going to take a long time until these other guys do. So you're going to need Saudi, which what does this mean when you're doing that? Well, Saudi is the biggest country in the Middle East land-wise, but population-wise, they're number five. Number one is Egypt, number two is Turkey, number three is Iran, then it's Iraq, then it's Saudi. So they don't have the most people, but they have the most land, they have the most oil, and they're in a location where they kind of need to get the other people to kind of work with them. So there is a lot of leverage for MBS to be able to do this, but I think he's the number one domino that can make this happen. So this doesn't work if only he has leverage, which is good. He has the leverage because he's got something everybody wants. But there's got to be something everybody else has on him for there to be an equal exchange, which is what? He's very ambitious. And what's the word he used? He used the word, defended his promotion of secular Western. Those two words don't get used in the Middle East, and it's supported by the elderly, which means if you want to do that, you have to make it safer. You have to get people like us that want to come to you. 87% of your country's GDP is tied to oil. That's like having a business that does a million dollars a year, but one of your clients does 870000 If that person, you're problematic if something happens there, right? Okay. So he needs other business. He needs other technology. He needs people to want to move there. He needs it to be safe. He needs entertainment. He needs a lot of different things. It's a lot of exchange here. Many different opportunities. If I was a president or a leader of a country, the first thing I would say, hey, let's figure out a way to collaborate to make it a safer place that people feel more comfortable moving there. What commitment can you make to the world for us to know that? What is that going to look like? That would be my first step. And I would look at making it even more peaceful in other countries around the area especially the number one enemy that they have, which is Iran. So if you got value out of this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you are interested in the Middle East, we did a video a few months ago titled, Are Muslims the Angriest People in the World? And by the way, you would be surprised where Armenians rank <laughs> on that list. If you've not seen it, click here to watch it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.